Coming up next, learn how this gets turned into something like this. Discover how a woman's pets inspire her art. Find out the stories behind African-inspired prints. And enjoy music by musicians who are great friends. It all starts now on FunAddicts.tv. Well, good afternoon. I'm Joni. And I'm Rich. Do you remember where you were the day the last Harry Potter book came out? We do because we were at the 21st Annual Connoisseur's Marketplace in Menlo Park. Visual, performing, and culinary arts are featured at this popular event. There's great music, cooking demonstrations, and more than 200 artists displaying their work. And because the event took place the day the last book came out, there's even a booth focusing on Harry Potter. What magic do you think we'll find there? Ooh, I'm looking forward to finding out. So let's get started. Yeah, let's go. The 21st Annual Connoisseur's Marketplace transformed Santa Cruz Avenue in downtown Menlo Park, California into a sea of booths showcasing handcrafted wares, including fine art, functional art, wearable art, sculptures, and mixed media. The Kids Fun Zone included a 24-foot climbing wall and a variety of other rides and things to do. A main stage entertained the crowds, many of whom also sampled the variety of food on sale for immediate consumption. For those planning to eat later, Gourmet Alley had a variety of vendors. Other booths throughout the marketplace featured many non-art items, including the Burt's Bees tent, where Joni was able to get a hand massage as she learned about the company's natural ingredient products. So tell me, who does this artwork? This artwork is done by Paul Nzalamba, uh, from Uganda. He's based in Los Angeles and has been living in the United States for 28 years. So all of this work has been done over the last 25 years. And uh, we are cousins uh, living in Los Angeles. And what my part here is to embellish each idea into a flowing story. I'm a storyteller. And, uh, you know, the two of us have worked hand in hand for about uh, 14 years doing shows mainly on the West Coast, but uh, all over the United States of America. So tell me more about the creative process. Now, does the artwork come first or does the storytelling come first? Good. The artwork comes first. And um, like you notice, every picture is a picture of a person. Um, I always joke and say, could you meet or think of meeting any person in the world and think they don't have a story? So obviously there is a story in, in Paul's mind as he works. And my job is to embellish that idea into a flowing, um, universal, um, connected story. And that's what I do. So your story is based on African tradition or? I would suggest uh, my story um, is really as I said, an embellishment of a universal idea. But the art form is very Ugandan in its style. It's all done as batik with wax and dyes, the normal batik process. And from the originals, we make prints and lithographs. But um, the stories, I would say, are directly an embellishment and, a, and, and an amplification of the fact that I've lived in Uganda, in Kenya, in Botswana, in the United States and wherever I have gone, just as Paul has traveled a lot, we have found universal themes that are represented here in this art. The themes of love, wanting a happier life, friendship and uh, connecting with others. And that's what's uh, represented here. I was, I, uh, that's beautiful. And in terms of adding the artistic value of storytelling behind it, yeah. You know, I, I looked at all the uh, wonderful, wonderful, colorful um, artwork, and I noticed, though, in terms of the people, it seems to be more dominated by um, female than it is male. Well, the truth is that, um, in my opinion, this is, a lot more truth has been depicted uh, through women. Um, I see a lot more in most cultures uh, represented just by body language. Sometimes you meet a woman of any culture and form and it seems that the expressions are free from women even without words there's almost a need for men to make some other noise or put things in sentences for us to understand the appeals of a man so you know some of the greats of, of the world the Mona Lisa and so on I think there's a reason why most of those happen to be feminine figures 
um, something is said about uh, the behavior or the mannerisms of women universally that come through, I think, more strongly than in men. And uh, Paul and I always joke that perhaps, hey, we, we do like women and we're very connected to the mothers that have brought us here. And uh, in my own father's words, hey, you've never seen a man who's brought a child into the world. So. And race it is, yeah. It takes both sides, yes, definitely. Yes. So one more question I had for you. Um, can you uh, share with us maybe one of your favorite stories okay. that, um, that brought about share, this creative pro process I'll for you? A uh, favorite story is perhaps the one that goes with the picture called disagreement, because I know that's Paul's favorite picture. And I think it has been in my background of doing this for so long, I felt it more challenging to bring up something positive out of a picture that looks subtle and has a tough title to deal with. This was this picture here called Disagreement. And I'm going to go through the explanation of it. This picture speaks of a healthy couple having a healthy disagreement. And why I call it healthy is because their love remains strong. They take the issue of conflict outside the home. It looks to us that they go to a tree. However, to them, they go to more than just a tree. They go back to the roots of their love and their love becomes this shelter for both of them with branches and fruit. They wear the same colors, even in the midst of turmoil to show that they'll always be related and always remain committed to this love that they share. On the right side is the man and he sits with his head slightly down. This doesn't mean men are always wrong. It means that in this particular case, this man perhaps has an issue in his heart to resolve. His feet are not quite grounded. On the other side sits the lady who waits patiently and she waits because the tree supports both of them. Love never takes sides and love has never failed them before. Some days they come to the tree because she is somewhat down, sometimes he is down, but most times they're both ecstatic with joy to be at this tree. Why? Because the tree fits both of them and most importantly, the tree fits only them. No one else belongs in this relationship that they share. And for every time they come to the tree, it is always here and always having grown bigger, their love is stronger than it ever was before. Perhaps, therefore, disagreements are just parts and parcel of every healthy relationship, perhaps punctuation marks that are there to remind us, with love you came together, with love you can overcome any issues of conflict. I would like to end there. Thank you so much for your storytelling. And I would like to have the audio portion attached to the picture. <laughs> well, that part you can actually get. Many people will take the picture and then on the back is a phone number they can call. And in my own voice, I will record the story on their voicemail for them to learn, commit to memory. And a lot of people have told me that in memorizing the story, but deliberating to write the words down, either personally or as a couple, it has brought them a very close sense of attachment to the story and therefore to the artwork. Well, that's just beautiful. It's Thank wonderful you. to be able to work with your family to bring about such a dynamic exposure to art as well as helping individuals, you. Um, you know, grow in strength and spirit and inspiration. Yes. Now you shared another story with us about this picture of Path Between and it was similar, it, it kind of went with the disagreement yes, picture. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about that story? All right. Well, Johnny, what it is, is that I, I sometimes do this love story as a two-part story. I did start with a disagreement. However, I will take you back to the origins and uh, it's something Paul and I always talk about, uh, about the power of a, a simple message. This illustrates that when two people fall in love, they come from two different paths in life. They join together and choose to walk on the same path. Provided they walk in the same direction and at the same pace, they start to learn about each other's strengths and weaknesses. They make adaptations towards one another's lives. And this is why the colors they wear are very similar within this picture. As they walk, they think of this love and where this love carries them they think a bit less about the places they have come from and where they met. Before they fell in love, he had his own path, she had her own path. Importantly, he knew his own path, she knew her own path. None of them knew the new path that they chose to take together. It sounds like to fall in love is something rather difficult. 
and uh, very uncertain. But in fact, to fall in love is something beautiful, joyous, and very certain, provided you walk with trust, commitment. Oh, you definitely have touched me emotionally just sharing with me, and I can imagine, uh, I just, just pleased to hear that you're able to take this in different directions with different people. What are some other ways they can find out about uh, the artwork if they're not here at the festival this afternoon? If they're not here at the festival, they can go to a website that we have, which is Nzalamba, N-Z-A-L-A-M-B-A dash artworks, A-R-T-W-O-R-K-S dot com. And we have a website and uh, it has a biography on, on Paul over there. But um, other than that, we do a lot of shows in the Bay Area, in San Francisco area and uh, in the Seattle area as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. Thank you. What type of music do you play? We play Italian music and international music in general, all kind of international music. But here we are playing Italian music. Okay, but you do play a variety because that's what I noticed as we came by the booth here was the Italian music. So, yeah, we play a lot of different music. We play some jazz standards, some folkloric music from South America, some tangos, uh, Italian again. <laughs> And what type of venues do you usually play at? Always festivals or other places? Yes, we play at private parties uh, for weddings and special events like that. But I was going to say, not only do we play international music, we play a lot of Hugo's uh, composer and arranger. So a lot of he arranged all of these songs we play. And he also, uh, uh, we also perform the songs that he's doing. Both uh, uh, contemporary, I mean, uh, all kinds of songs, ballads and everything else. Latin songs, South American songs. He's quite an amazing guy. <laughs> so how the two of you meet? We met through a common friend, a Peruvian guy who plays the mandolin, a very good friend of ours. Uh, his name is Carlos Lopez. And uh, he played the mandolin. I, was, I played the guitar with him when I came here. And uh, he knew Al, they were playing in a mandolin orchestra together. And so he said, do you don't mind, you know, he joined us. Of course not, I mean, the more the merrier. So we play as a trio for a while, and then he wanted to play mainly classical music, and we wanted to play a lot of other stuff. So he left playing classical music, and we're here playing our Italian and international. I mean, is there a good following for your style of music? Well, actually, the way it started, I just wanted to, um, to play music that I grew up with and hearing from my father. He played a little bit of mandolin, my brother was a professional flutist, uh, Raymond Fabrizio, uh, quite quite well known, and he uh, he got cancer and one and within a few months was gone. And I I felt like music should continue because Ray's whole family is very musical. His daughter Rita and his uh, and Carla and um, his son uh, Raymond Jr. So I picked up my father's mandolin that I used to fool with, and I started to take it seriously. And when I met Hugo, then I really started to play and I wanted to do these songs that I grew up with and uh, that's what started and suddenly uh, they sold and took off and I walked away from my business. I had a uh, advertising graphic arts business, publishing, and I also taught it at the university and I just walked away from all that and we're enjoying this now, kind of reinventing my life in my old age and following Hugo along with all the things he does. <laughs> and are you able to go full time with your music too? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. full time. That's yeah. our... That's our living. Well, mention the studio we have. Uh, uh, we have a recording studio, Mountain View, and uh, so we record other people, and we record ourselves as well. And uh, and I'm busy doing other people's production as well, and we are busy during the weekends uh, playing uh, festivals. And we like playing festivals because it's so much fun. People really enjoy what we do, and it's you know, it's it's an environment where you know. It's very positive for us, so that's why you know, we keep going, and we have a wonderful friendship, and so this is more like a business kind of thing. We are pretty. <laughs> I should brag a little more about about Hugo. Um, two of the al albums that he produced in our studio were nominated for Bami Awards. I guess they're called Northern California Music Awards. One uh, Critics Choice called the best Latin album of the year. That's called Kisoy. And two of the songs he wrote on it are just fabulous. They're sure to be big winners. 
So even though we're a small studio, we've already been having good exposure and we're very grateful. Yeah. How can people find out uh, more about your music or how can they contact you? They can go to our website, which is www.heartstringsmusic.com and we have our albums in there and some you know pictures and uh, some information it's still under construction we need to add some more stuff for people to have fun but uh, we're getting there we're getting there and you also find out about your recording studio there too yeah there's information about the recording studio although i'm not advertising uh, my recording studio i mean full swing because we need time for doing our productions and the music that I compose. I have several artists recording albums of the music that I compose. And so I need the time, all the studio time just for us. And so I'm just doing very little uh, outside work and concentrating more in our, you know, our music. And uh, that's why, you know, we feel that the studio, our little haven that, you know, we can have a lot of fun and you know, and, um, and and try to do more music, so. Thank you. You know, if you don't mind, I'd love to end our visit with you, with you performing one of your songs. And actually, I was thinking it was going to be folk music, but I'd love to have one of your original compositions. Oh. Well, <laughs> what would you like to play for us? Well, let's play something um, from our album. From our and album, And then maybe yeah. you could do something. Uh... Then we, when we rehearse better, we get the other stuff. <laughs> no, he can do something by himself uh, that, that would be very well. I think oh. just accompany him in some way. Yeah. Okay, so we'll hear something great then. So.
stop by and I know this wonderful banner, Stately to Moth Art, happiness is not a destination, it's a method of life. Tell me about your motto. Um, well, happiness is, there's just not enough funny out there. And when I look at my dogs and they do something funny, it really amuses me. So my, um, my work is steeped in that. If I could capture that little feeling of joy when I'm walking and I'm in my head and I walk by my dog and they're doing something really funny, you're sleeping in a funny position, it just cracks me up. So I try to do that. And one of the ways that I do that is with my dog knockers. <laughs> and I've waited a lot of years to say I have the best knockers in town. <laughs> And my big boys have big boys. So oh, let's see that again. Big boys. Oh, okay. Maybe it just gets funnier. <laughs> so you let people at your front porch know how dog obsessed you are and that there's probably going to be a dog in their immediate future. Oh, so it's almost a, almost a warning signal as well as for guests that are coming to uh, pay a visit. Exactly. I had a friend once tell me um, that she would base her friends on a criteria. If you found a butter in your uh, hair in your butter dish, would you be grossed out? And if they didn't get grossed out, she said they could be my friends. So, you know, if you have a dog, those kind of things are funny, as in the greetings, which is the authentic greetings. I've had people say that they aren't politically correct, but they actually are. Dogs are most, the most authentic things I know, and they're more authentic than most people I know. And they bring me as much joy. But you don't, you're not recommending to have more happiness in life by, you know, humans snipping each other's butt when they greet each other. Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think that would be a really good idea. It would be really funny if I knew <laughs> if I knew them really well. That would go over great. It would be fun. You know, my girlfriend Carrie and I could do that at a party. We'd think it was hilarious. Nobody else, of course, would get it. So I also carry that uh, same theme into a lot of my jewelry. Um, I have themes on the back of a lot of the pieces, like this little piece right here I did for Mother's Day. It has a little dog on the front, and the back of it reads, can you get in? Right, Rav Rue. That was for Mother's Day. I oh, that's wonderful. Is that a Scooby? Uh... That's what my dogs say every time I look at them. I'm sure that's what they're saying to me. I also do Live, Laugh, and Bark and Bless This Beast. I also do cat stuff because a lot of my cat customers get mad at me because I don't have as much cat art. But I do Live, Laugh, and Pounce. I have some new cat images that have two little kitties on them and their tails form a heart. And on the back of the heart it says meow. So I try to, I try to broaden my horizons and not, not include anybody's love of their life. So do you think the world's a better place when cats and dogs can get along? <laughs> I think any time you have an animal, it's like pet therapy. You just look at your dog and you see this, or your horse, or your, I have chickens, I look at my chickens and they crack me up and I just think, oh, you are so sweet. And it takes me out of the world and into a whole different little being. So how long have you been doing this? I've been, um, the dog jewelry has been about six years now, but I've always made something. When I was a kid, my mom and I would make paper mache roses or, you know, gluing mac colored macaroni uh, to Christmas cards, which didn't go over well because they didn't mail so good. Um, but yeah, I've made stuff all my life. Now, I, let's, I noticed you have some jewelry, you have some things hanging for uh, wall hangings, but I noticed there's some cards over here. Can you tell me a little bit I about have, that? I have great models for my cards, and I'll show you. I started out, I've always made cards for gifts, for friends, Christmas cards. But I have the greatest models in the world. This one is of my dog, Frank. And I came home from a show, and my husband said, Frankie's been in the stickers. And I said, so what else is new? He said, no, really. She, her eyelashes were stuck to the side of her face. <laughs> she had so many stickers, she got to go to pause. She was, she was walking like she was a mummy. <laughs> um, and those, the little things in life like that, I mean, I'm sure she was miserable, but it's like so endearing. She really needed me to help her out. <laughs> um, and if I can create something and I can find humor and I see people looking through my cards and they're cracking up. Another one of Frankie, thinking of you, wish you would change. Who doesn't have this friend? Relative, neighbor. Um, so I see other So have you my... sent that, way? I wanna know, have you sent that to somebody? Oh yeah, I, I sent it in tongue in cheek and seriously, so many times. Um, but I see people laughing at it, so I know what I'm thinking is being, they're getting it. When somebody else gets my art, I know I've done my job. Oh, that's excellent. So now, um, has this caught on with other family members? Um, no. <laughs> well, I have really good models. I, nobody else in my family does art. My husband's really good at tractor work. 
Oh, that's great. That's great. So he does the... He uh, builds me studios and builds me frames and helps me when I need the big things done. Oh, that's excellent. So tell me, any future plans on, or ideas of your artwork expanding? or? Well, you know, my goal right now is um, pretty lofty. <laughs> my goal is to get my artwork on Oprah. And if Oprah likes my work, then I know I'm on the road. That's and if I can do art for a living and my husband can drive his tractor and just fix things for a living, that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, then, then happiness is not a destiny. There. <laughs> We'd be there. <laughs> That's actually, well, I'm glad I'm here this afternoon to, oh. to learn more about you and your artwork. And if those who weren't here, how could they find out more about you? They can find me on the web. You can Google Stacy Lamoth. You can reach me at www.stacylamothart.com. Excellent. And let's bring your friend over. Because she's my the best one friend in the whole wide world, <laughs> Carrie. Now it's on TV. Who waves pom? Nobody else can have this place now. <laughs> she waves pom poms better than any other person I know. She's the best cheerleader ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have somebody in your corner cheering you along. She's great, and she's so creative. She just amazes me and makes me laugh all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. You came highly recommended, uh -huh. and I'm glad we stopped by. Great. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. that you uh, do stone turning. What exactly is stone turning? <laughs> well, um, I, it's a process where it's very similar to uh, wood turning. Um, I do it on a, a wood lathe, but uh, it's actually done with stone. So I use a variety of uh, Italian alabaster, Brazilian soapstone, Italian agate, uh, Colorado alabaster, the softer stones. What gave you the inspiration to do this? Um, I have been a, a wood turner um, all my life, uh, kind of as a hobby, and uh, um, I, uh, my wife and I had a passion for uh, stone, and we always just wanted to just kind of explore that passion, and so one day I decided just to try stone on a lathe, and I never turned back. Are you one of the first people doing this? Um, no, I'm not. There's there's a couple of stone turners out there. There's there's not a whole lot of us. Um, it's there's no knowledge on it. Um, it's a self-taught type of a thing. Um, and so, uh, if a person wants to do it, it's you're pretty much on your own. You have to kind of discover it and figure out all the problems and work them out yourself. I know. So look at you. Know, when I first saw the the term stone turning, I was assuming you used just one piece of stone. But it looks like some of it does have a look of like wood, where it's inlaid and such with multiple pieces. What is that? Oh yeah, um, I do a process um, a segmentation. It's uh, segmentation is a process that kind of, or is a name that kind of derived from the wood turning community. Uh, segments basically means pieces, and um, I do a combination of. I, I try to mix some exotic woods with some of the stones. Try to take it to the next level. Um, just to Sometimes the stone on its own is quite beautiful. Um, sometimes I get an inspiration to add an exotic wood to add a, a striking contrast or another exciting element to the vessel. So that's why I kind of merge, you know, the different stones with the uh, different uh, woods. Okay, so explain to me what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is one of the rings that I would make up and I would glue this onto a vessel. Um, I'll start with individual pieces of stone. Um, this is this is two different types of stone. This, this whiter stone is Italian alabaster and this orange stone is uh, Utah orange alabaster. And then I have that uh, laminated, between. you know, copper is laminated in between that. And so all of that gets epoxied together. And once that epoxy is cured, I'll go ahead and sand that surface smooth. Then I'll take that whole surf or that whole ring and that will get epoxied onto another piece of stone exactly like one of these and then that'll cure and then once that's done then I take that whole chunk put it on the lathe and then I'll turn that final shape end up with something like this. exactly and so the really interesting thing about this vessel is the mm -hmm. fact that even though this is just Italian agate up here which really doesn't contain any pink in color you'll notice that you'll see these these pink gradations right there next to the copper what's happening is you just have the natural sunlight reflect going down penetrating into the stone hitting the copper and reflecting that pink light back out into the stone so it adds yet another dimension that you wouldn't get like in a solid surface material like uh, or a non-transparent material like wood so that's how that's done now we're here in Menlo Park and I know you are actually from Menlo Park too is that right yes it is yeah I'm local yeah. 
So do you uh, mainly reach your customers or, or your clients through fairs like this, or how do you reach them? Well, I started out actually in galleries. Um, I'm probably in about 13 galleries now. We just got into another four this month, and we'll be announcing those on our website. Um, um, this is our second year in Menlo Park. Um, we, Menlo Park was where we got started on the uh, street fairs, and it was so successful last year that this year we decided to do three, so we tripled our efforts, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen next year. Maybe we're going to double them or triple them again, so we'll see. What inspires your individual pieces? In fact, could you maybe talk about a couple of the pieces for us? Which ones you like? Um, sure. Um, inspiration. Well, I mean, right now my current inspiration is kind of the Greek and or Egyptian themes. Um, I've always been intrigued by just the Egyptian history, just the the, the tombs, the uh, uh, the pharaohs, just the, everything about Egypt is just very intriguing to me. And so. Um, I, when I when I just watch a show on Egypt or some of the great pharaohs, I just I just get in that mood. And so um, recently, I've been doing a, a style of vessel called an amphora, which is kind of either a Greek or an Egyptian-based shape. And um, so I, I just they just kind of develop. I don't really go into it with an exact shape in mind. I just start turning and just let them just form. And so. They just, I, I think the stone itself inspires me. Now, the closer I get to things like woodworking and such, maybe a little carpentry, but what happens? I mean, how often do you like lose a piece of stone or is that something where you can actually repair mistakes? Like, Well, normally you don't repair a mistake. I mean, the stone is, I would say it's fairly unforgiving. You make one mistake and usually the rest of the vessel ends up on the floor. Um, it's it's very brittle, so you have to be careful. If, if your tool catches, usually that's the end of it. Um, so, I just have to go slow, take my time, and, and really, it's it's a matter of focus. Just 100% focus on what you're doing. Don't get distracted by a dog barking or anything like that. No. How long do your pieces take? I know there are various sizes and such, but is there a typical amount of time you spend? Um, that's probably my number one question. Um, I, I, I wish I could put a, an hour on it. Um, a vessel can take anywhere from a day to a week. Um, it really, it depends on so many factors, uh, complexity of the shape, the type of stone I'm using. Um, some stones are easier to turn than others. And the other factor is I'm never really turning one stone, at, or working, I, I say, or per se, I'm never really working on one stone or one vessel at any given time. I've usually got four or five kind of in a queue or maybe I'm doing a glue up of a ring on one and maybe I'm doing a base on another and turning a third. So I kind of have kind of almost like an assembly of different stages of vessels at any given time. That's great. And what is your website so people can find out more information? Uh, the website is exoticvessels.com. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. As I was walking by here, it felt like I wanted to turn some pages and find a little bit more about Kepler's books and magic. And we're here speaking with Jeff Kusher. I'm a staff leader at Kepler's, and I was involved in last night's major event with the release of the seventh Harry Potter book. We're uh, at this point sold out temporarily. Uh, all 2,000 of our initial shipment uh, sold out between 12:01 last night and about 9 o'clock this morning. We have two copies of the special edition, which is about $65 in a cloth uh, binding here. But we have more arriving this afternoon and more tomorrow, so customers can come on down and be sure of getting one. Excellent. So how many pages is the new book? You know, I haven't uh, counted, but it's one of the thicker volumes. Um, and I haven't, I have to confess, started reading my copy yet. Uh, I've only got about two hours sleep after last night's event. So, um, But we're happy to be out here and enjoying the fine weather and all the other uh, great uh, exhibitors here. So excellent, so tell me now, tell me a little bit about Kepler's book now, it's an independent bookstore. That's right, and that's becoming more and more of a rarity in the United States. Uh, just a few years ago there were more than 10,000 and now there are about 1,500. Um, but Kepler's uh, is a Menlo Park institution and uh, although we had some difficulties last year and temporarily closed our doors, the community came forward and really said, this is something that makes Menlo Park what it is. So uh, we're reopened, we're doing quite well. We have a new business plan, uh, a newly neg negotiated rental agreement. Um, and, but we're doing a lot more in terms of events that bring people into the store. 
a lot more author events and uh, a special events like uh, the Harry Potter uh, uh, release, um, which seems to generate a lot more interest around the store as not just a bookstore, but as a, a cultural center as well. So we have uh, poetry clubs, we have uh, book clubs that meet there. Um, it's really becoming more than a store, and that's, that's great. Now, when you say drawing people to the store now, you were dressed quite different than last night. You told me earlier. Yes. Uh, well, we all decided uh, on staff that we should dress as characters. Uh, the only two characters we didn't uh, try to uh, uh, dress as were Dumbledore, because he's now deceased, and uh, Harry Potter himself. We figured there'd be a lot of Harry Potters, and there were. Um, but I was Madame Maxine, the um, headmistress of the Bobeton Academy of Magic in France. And uh, she happens to be a giantess, and she's seven and a half feet tall. So I was on stilts in a very long purple gown. And you can never have too many boas, and I had quite a few boas. So the kids found that very entertaining, and uh, those who weren't terrified. <laughs> we also had Death Eaters. We had uh, people who were uh, uh, Professor Snape and uh, all of the other major characters. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I was surprised that at midnight, when we did the final countdown and released this line of people, that uh, folks were still so excited. People would get up to the front of the line and see the book for the first time and scream. It was like like when the Beatles came to America. Um, so people were very excited about this book. That's excellent. So tell me, um, how did you uh, work with the crowds in terms of how long was the lines and how did that work out? Well, we knew that we had pre-sales uh, of about 1,500 books. So we figured most of those folks would stick around. So we planned for a line of about 1,500 people uh, to the north of the store and then wrapping around Menlo Square. Um, at the south end of the store, we had a much shorter line that was for people who were wanting to purchase with cash or credit cards, uh, but had not pre-reserved a book. That moved a little more slowly because they had to do a cash transaction. When we opened the main line with the pre-sales, we had 10 tables set up, fully stocked with books, and we had 12 people along that line of, ta of tables directing people to the empty tables as they were available. So it really only took about 30 minutes to get all 1,500 people booked in hand and, and settled in, and many of them immediately started reading their books. That's amazing. Now, I know it's been a long-awaited event, so did you see anybody actually turning to the back of the book to find out what happened? No, we did not. And uh, it's interesting, uh, although there have been some releases on the, on the inter Internet and there's been a review in a couple of newspapers, uh, which the publisher and the authors are not happy about, um, uh, I know among the fans, they really want to preserve that, that uh, you know, unexpected uh, ending and uh, find, find it themselves. So, again, we had lots of people sitting down and they were all starting at the front and uh, start reading their books immediately last night. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the paraphernalia or the interesting items and maybe you have a favorite you'd like to share it with us? Well, we have a number of wizard hats. Uh, all official uh, Harry Potter items uh, approved by the publisher. Are you saying he's a wizard now? Well, yeah, yes. And, uh, of course, the Harry Potter glasses. Um, we have a particularly popular item, the Golden Snitch, from the Quidditch game. Uh, Quidditch glasses. And then my favorite are the, are the various candies. Um, the Bernie Bot's Every Flavor Beans which uh, are a favorite amongst the, the Hogwarts students. They do have some new flavors this year, uh, Rotten Egg being one, and um, I particularly like the grass flavor. I don't know why, but it, it actually tastes pretty good. Does it taste like grass? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do they have sand as well? Uh, no, but they have, they have bacon, they have buttered popcorn, um, they have tutti frutti, they have soap. Um, some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But these were a very hot seller last night. So parents might want to use that soap flavor in case their That's kids right, are yeah. needing a little mouth washing. Exactly, and the guide lets you sort out by color which beans they actually are. So. And we sold out of my favorite, which is the chocolate frogs. Of course, the chocolate frogs come with a, a wizard picture, 
and a lot of folks were trying to collect all of the wizard pictures last night, so a lot of chocolate frogs were sold. Now, when you say books and magic, tell me a little bit about the magic piece of Kepler's. Well, we like to think, by way of associating with Harry Potter, that we um, have become a bit magical, but I think that also refers back to the fact that as an independent bookstore that was really saved by its community, um, we, we recognize that that's a magical thing. Uh, not every community's been able to do that. Uh, here, even here in the Bay Area, Cody's has had some difficulty over in the East Bay, and uh, some of the independents in the San Francisco area have, have not done uh, so well. So we feel really lucky, lucky, fortunate, and magical to be in, in Menlo Park and with our Palo Alto and Redwood City uh, neighbors. Uh, people who got involved as volunteers and as members uh, of our literary circle and uh, who you know, maybe pay a little more sometimes, but they come because of the ambiance, because of the service. Uh, we have experts in the store who can help advise if someone's looking for a book, whether it's a mystery or um, you know, a particular special order, we can track things down. And that's something that you don't get at some of the chain stores. So. Um, that's a community resource that I think is kind of magical. So tell me, before we leave you this afternoon, and of course, I'm sure tonight you're going to be opening up your Harry Potter book, which is entitled? Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Hmm, sounds spooky. I understand it's kind of dark. Well, uh, I don't know, and I'm waiting to find out. <laughs> so don't tell me if you know. <laughs> okay. So what would you say to our viewers about... Um, the need um, for us to keep independent bookstores alive. Uh, without independent bookstores, you really reduce the amount of choice. Because, as I say, one of the things that we do is not only keep a wide variety of titles in the store, um, we have quite a large physical plant, a, a large store, but we also uh, take special orders, and we will try to track books down for folks. Um, our information counter is one of the most interesting places to work. I know as a customer, when I used to come to Kepler's, I always marveled at how, how they can find these things. And now I know some of those secrets, because uh, I've worked on the, on the inside of the information counter. But it's, it's a fascinating and rewarding thing to help somebody find a book when they come in and they say, I don't know the author, I don't know the title, but it has something to do with the Grand Canyon and when it was first discovered and you know usually we can we can find the title for them and then order the book if it's still available uh, a lot of books uh, have gone out of print and we can offer resources then including another a great store here in our town feldman's has a great selection of used books uh, but there are also some online sources that we can refer people to so it's just a, a a great thing to be helpful to people in finding the books they're looking for so can you recall any interesting um, requests that you've had? Well, I remember one person came in and she didn't really know what kind of book she wanted. She wanted um, a gift book and um, she wanted it to have something to do with India. And she thought maybe a, an Indian cooking book or if there was some history. Um, so we looked in several different sections and we finally uh, came to the photo uh, section. And there was just a beautiful uh, coffee table book that was uh, color photographs from all over India. And um, as she was looking through it, she was remembering places that she had been on her trip uh, with this person that she wanted to give this gift to. And so it was just the perfect match. And when you have someone who leaves the store just pleased with something that they didn't expect to find, uh, it just makes your day. So, so making personal collection uh, connections with books is very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think all the Kepler's employees feel that way. It's a very special place to work. And how many employees do you have? We have about 40. Uh, a lot of them are part-time. A lot of them are students. Um, but uh, they, as I say, they're remarkably uh, broadly uh, talented in terms of their backgrounds and, and their areas of expertise. So if we have someone who's looking for a mystery, we get them to our mystery people. Uh, if we have somebody who's looking for a travel book, um, you know, we have folks who are specialists in those areas. Um, we have some standing recommendations for people who are just looking for a good read. And uh, especially in the summertime, a, a lot of folks are in that category. Um, we have a lot of customers who come back and having trusted the recommendation of a particular employee, 
we'll seek out that employee again to say, okay, I love that book. What would you recommend now? Uh, so it's building those relationships that really makes an independent local bookstore a, a community resource. So coming into the bookstore physically is an experience within itself, but uh, what if you're unable to get down to the bookstore, Kepler's, how else can they um, go about and um, experience this uh, wonderful independent outfit? Well, they certainly can call us on the phone, and those phone lines uh, connect directly to the information counter, so we can look up, uh, determine if we have a book in stock or if we need to special order it. We also have uh, an online uh, service, which is at keplers.com, um, and customers can actually see in the daily inventory updates whether we have a, a title in stock by looking it up on, on Kepler's.com. And they can place an order and, and give credit card information and either come in and pick up the book or have it shipped to them. So um, we're not exactly like Amazon.com, uh, but we do have that capability. And uh, some people like to call and talk about a book and then place their order online uh, just because it's simpler to do the physical transaction that way. Well, maybe a good thing that you're not like Amazon.com. Yeah. We, we like to be different. <laughs> well, thank you. This is very a, a wonderful way to spend our afternoon here um, and experiencing all the interesting uh, paraphernalia. And I noticed, though, I don't see a whole lot of books here, but you have to go into the store to find those. That's right. That's right. We, uh, we brought a lot of merchandise over. All of the books that we brought uh, were Harry Potter books, and they have all sold, as I say, but two. So, yeah, the, but the store is just jam-packed full of books. So. Well, hopefully we'll enter another chapter um, in the next decade and then come back down here and see Kepler still in operation. That would be great. Okay. We look forward to seeing you. All right. Thank you. Rich! Rich! Where are you? If Joni ever has trouble finding me at one of these festivals, all she has to do is look for the best food. And at the Connoisseur's Market, the best food is found here at Gourmet Alley. What is your company? What makes it so special? Well, we just have a nice blend of products here. Um, the balsamics have been aged up to 18 years, and so that makes them nice and sweet, different than other balsamics that are more tart. People seem to like those. I think, too, with our olive oils and with the balsamics, it is what it is. If it says it's a fig balsamic, you're going to taste the fig. Many times you will taste a balsamic or an olive oil, and you don't taste the flavor that's in there. Ours definitely. Are well, I don't know that much about balsamics, but if you don't mind, I'm going to try sample one of yours because I do know what I like. Okay, now these and are I grilling sauces. Oh, okay. Is our 18-year-old balsamic? It's good on meats. I grill uh, pineapples with those peaches. Uh, it's good over strawberries with a little black pepper. I add it to my spaghetti sauce. So, yeah. Anything you want. Anything you want. And what are these down here in front? Okay, these are our grilling sauces. And we have a Kentucky bourbon, which we've sold out of today. Uh, a chipotle chili, a ginger teriyaki, and an apricot brandy. And how do people use these? These are good just for grilling, basically. Um, the, you want to put it on when they're cooking, close towards the end, because of the sugar content, everything will burn. So it doesn't matter if it's beef, poultry, fish? No, not at all. I have done duck with this. I've done pork, chicken, the um, chipotle. I've actually put in a meatloaf. So it just, again, it's whatever you want to do. Okay, let me just try one of these down here. I'm going to try the chipotle. Hmm. Don't even need to put it on anything and grill it. Tastes good. My husband and I uh, started the business. We used to be farmers in Fredericksburg, Texas, and we developed our food line around what we grew. So, and then this outgrew our, produ our uh, food production on the farm. So we still do all the cooking, but we've got other people raising foods for us. Are you still based in Texas? No, we're in Arizona right now. We moved from Fredericksburg, Texas about three, four years ago, and we are in Arizona. And when it gets hot there, we come to California. So what types of things do you have here today? We have hot and not hot. We have uh, preserves that taste like fresh fruit, low in sugar. We have fruit hot sauces, salsas, and we have savories. What do you have for me to try first? Hot or not hot? Hot sounds good. Hot sounds good. We have a hatch green chili sauce. It's a New Mexico chili. It's known for its flavor and also its heat. And you're going to get the sweetness. There's a little spoon right there. You're going to get the sweetness and the flavor of the pepper. 
and then you get the heat. Okay, here it goes. Here we go. Sweet. I can definitely feel heat. Oh, good. It doesn't feel like I'm gonna. My mouth's gonna be burning forever. Medium Just a heat. little bit. Yeah, medium, medium heat. That's good. I'm glad it wasn't the super hot. I okay. I'm doing that to you. <laughs> yeah. You said you have a sweet one also. Uh, we have some sweet ones. Actually, uh, you said you have some honeys too. We have honeys. I wouldn't mind trying one of your honeys. Okay. We have an orange blossom or a mesquite, and it's all natural raw honey. It has all those good enzymes in it. I've never heard of mesquite. I'd like to try that. What makes it mesquite? Now, I, I saw a movie, Yuli's Gold, years ago, and I forget the type of honey it was, and I've heard the song Tupelo Honey. So is it based on the bees, or what makes the honeys different? It's the pollen. It's the, it's the flowers that the, the, you know, the pollen comes from the flowers of the plant that the bees gather, and that's where you get your flavor. Okay. I'm ready for it. Now I'll get another spoon. Now this one, you're going to get the smoothness of the honey, and then you get a little citrus right at the back end. This is mesquite? Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is a mesquite. You get, it's a robust flavor. It's not smoky, like a lot of people think it's smoky, but it's just a real smooth, robust flavor. Here we go. Oh, that's very good, very smooth, very smooth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Where can people find out more about your business? As I drop it. <laughs> we are Terra Verde Farms. We're online. Well, we have lots of good stuff. Uh, we have a wine garlic mustard. This uh, has lots of garlic and a burgundy wine in it. Our most popular, though, is this uh, pumpkin pie butter. It uh, tastes just like pumpkin pie in a jar. You spread it on toast, bagels, pancakes, waffles. It's very good. It's even good on ice cream. You want to try a little bit? Actually, you know, I'm not a big pumpkin fan. I noticed you had a cherry pie butter, though. Is that a similar experience? Yeah, exactly. But for cherry pie lovers, right? Exactly. That's me. All right, well, here's a little cherry pie butter for you. So you spread oh, very that good. on, like, uh, bagels and cream cheese. I'm a jerky jobber. I've been in the jerky business for over 25 years, jobbing jerky all over California. I, all kinds of jerky. Today we're displaying kippered beef jerky which has a higher moisture content, soft, easy to chew, as compared to, to the, the old dried. dried beef, which is like the old cowboys used to make. Do you guys carry both because some people prefer the dry? We've got over 24 different varieties and styles. Today we're just displaying four for the people. Now the ones you have here, is this considered more gourmet jerky because you're in Gourmet Alley, or is there such a thing? It is indeed. What makes it gourmet? The kippered beef, the, the high moisture content, these are thick, moist cuts. So it makes it kind of unique in the sense of it can't be, it's not usually retailed in retail markets. Reason being, here's like a half pound bag and it takes up just a little bit of space or, and it retails for $15. Where if it was a dried beef like this, this is a one pound bag. If it's thin, it's like a huge bag. So unless you're a huge corporation in marketing and you know advertising, people compare and they see the size and they don't really know. So sale or we do festivals like this when we can sample to the people and the public and then they know the difference. Speaking of samples, what do you recommend? Uh, the most popular is the teriyaki flavor. Let me try the teriyaki. You got it. Well, let's see its reaction. <laughs> okay, here we go for teriyaki. <laughs> sure you may. Hmm. Is it moist? It's very moist. Doesn't ruin my dentures. That's right. <laughs> Actually, that's why I don't have dentures because I don't chew up no, that old a, dry stuff. Here's a teriyaki with a little bit of seasoning on it, so it's a little more flavor. Okay. Now the bag says hot on this. Let's see if this is hot enough to really cause me problems. Great. <laughs> and what we are your? From Sierra Madre, a little town in the foothills of San Gabriel's, doesn't even have a traffic light. Does it have a treasure? It does. Up in the mountains. The Wisteria tree. <laughs> oh, okay. A uh, uh, last question is, what are you guys, what is your involvement with the company? I mean, do you make the food? Do you just sell it? Do you market it? What do you guys do? Yes, I'm a, sort of the one-man band. I make it, market it, and I travel selling my jerky. And Dan's a friend of mine from way back when, uh, kindergarten. So you're here to just kind of support him for some of these festivals you get a little too busy for one person. Every time I come to Northern California, now in the uh, springtime, look it for me at the Cow Palace at the, uh, the rodeo. I'll be the there Grand for two National. weeks. 
Wow, do you sell a lot of jerky at the rodeo? Over 600 pounds of jerky. Just from you? Yes. Those cowboys love their jerky. <laughs> and do they prefer my the- kind of people. Do they prefer the dry or the moist? Uh, when I do sampling at the shows, everyone likes the moist. Although you get the old timers that come out there and they say, where's that dried stuff? And I've got it. Joni, it looks like you found some magic. I sure did, but not all the magic was good. These birdie butts, some of the flavors are not so tasty. You mean vomit's not your idea of a tasty treat? <laughs> no way, but sure was a treat visiting the Harry Potter booth and learning more about how an independent bookstore is still appreciated by its community. I was amazed by the artist Stone Turner and the beauty and craftsmanship of his work. You know, not all the exhibits were new to us. You know, when they say that a picture paints a thousand words, I loved hearing the stories behind those African prints. Oh, I admired that for so long. I really appreciated all the people who participated in this episode. It was great meeting them. We hope you enjoyed visiting the 21st Annual Connoisseur's Marketplace. It was a great time for us. I'm Rich. And I'm Joni. We're always looking for fun. And we hope we brought you some, because we're, we're the fun, fun addicts. addicts. Yeah. Hey, let's practice some magic. Thanks for watching. For more information, please visit our website, funaddicts.tv.